Hi, everyone. That was a, a wonderful sell by Alistair of my session. Uh, no, we will not be talking about the NSA, and, and we did not build Prism, just, just, just so everybody's clear. Um, I, uh, I work for Palantir Technologies. Uh, one of my titles is Senior Software Engineer. I started there actually writing a lot of, a lot of the back end that, that makes our systems go. Uh, today, my, I'm an engineering ambassador, so I go out and talk about the things that we do and sort of explain the technology behind what we're doing. Today, I want to talk about data um, and in a couple different ways. Um, the first is to really look at the, the opportunity that, that data can actually provide for startups, for companies uh, in the world today. So anytime you, you talk about data, you need some uh, visual representation of how the amount of data in the world is increasing. Here we can see the size of data doubling over time, right? Um, very, very technical slide. But actually, what I, what I do want to talk about here is uh, the, the ecosystem of technologies available to do data analysis. So people talk about like the big data era beginning in like 1999 when Teradata built the first uh, terabyte scale database for Walmart. And we've come a long way since then. Uh, usually there's a, sort of a pattern where Google produces a technology, they write a paper about it, uh, like MapReduce or Google File System, uh, and then someone will, will implement it as an open source project. So in the case of MapReduce, it's Hadoop. Um, Amazon actually had a technology called, um, or has a technology called Dynamo. Um, they, uh, Facebook actually implemented that in, in open source or something called Cassandra. So there's this, actually this huge ecosystem of tools that are available for anyone who wants to, um, who, who wants to do large scale data processing and do really interesting things with data. Um, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, these tools are actually quite primitive, right? So this is actually a blog post from, I think it's June of last year, from Teradata again. They're like, we have bolted SQL onto Hadoop. And this is like a huge leap forward in the interface to this kind of data. Well, it's true that SQL makes available using that kind of like big data analysis uh, to a larger group of people, but it's still a very small group of people in the world who know SQL. In fact, most of the people who are interested in what you can do with data know a lot about the real world problems that data represents, but, doesn't, but don't actually know anything about how data systems work. And if you give them a SQL prompt, no matter what's behind it, they go, I don't know what to do with that. They need an interface that's actually much more sort of intuitive and, and speaks their language. So what this means um, in in the technology and the startup world is that this is an incredible opportunity, right? So anytime that there's sort of this sort of disconnect between what people want and, and what's available, there's an opportunity to sort of solve these challenges. So I, the way that I like to think about data as an opportunity is that there's four different dimensions that you can, you can optimize on and you can do more than one, right? Uh, you can take any, any combination of, of all four of them. So the first one is, is integration, right? And so integration is taking different disparate data sets that all represent the same problem out in the world and bring them together in a coherent way so that you can look at them as, a, as sort of a fused whole as opposed to separate silos of data. Uh, the second is scale, um, and that is just dealing with the explosion of data. When we, when we look at um, machine-generated data sets like web logs, like one of the examples I'll be talking about, this is like a, a bank that's generating 500 gigabytes of log data off their web servers a day, right? Half a terabyte a day of data. So scale itself is a problem, and anything you can do to help people deal with scale, um, there's definitely value to be created there. Uh, the third is automated analysis. So once you have this data, maybe it's been integrated, maybe you're dealing with the issues of scale, being able to use some sort of algorithmic analysis, some sort of transformation to turn it into uh, information, to turn it into knowledge, to turn it into wisdom. We sort of think of this as a pyramid with, with raw data at the bottom. You, you do some processing on it, it becomes information. From information, you can derive knowledge. And then once you have enough knowledge, you actually have gained wisdom. Um, and the final is actually interface UX sort of access plays, right? So going back to sort of the, the, the issue of bolting SQL onto Hadoop and that being really not that big of a deal to most of the people who want to do things with data, um, taking these, these large amounts of data and giving people, the people who want to actually ask questions of the data, giving them a way to get at the data and be able to ask their own questions. If you think about like the, the whole emerging field of data science, um, there are all these people who are chasing data scientist jobs, and usually the decision makers, the people who are interested in getting things out of the data, their interface to the data is a person is a data scientist where they say, hey, can you answer this question and that question and this other question? And they say, okay, well, let me go and spend three days and figure out what the answer is. And then they have this very slow iteration cycle. So anything you can do to, to increase ease of access and ease of use to data also has incredible value. So some examples of, uh, of companies that have actually made this their business models. The first one is uh, probably you've all heard of them. Um, they're pretty well known. Uh, they're called Google. Uh, so 
they uh, have made data their business, right? So they've actually taken all four of those, of those dimensions and like the Google search engine actually embodies all of those things. It, it deals with scale, it can pull in the entire web, it can integrate all this information from all these different sources. They're actually starting to integrate all, or have already integrated many different data sources, including geospatial, airline schedules, all these things into a single coherent interface and model, uh, which is the simple search bar, right? Um, and so Google is kind of this shining example on the hill, and people like to think of Google as this, this, this massive behemoth, but you know, when I remember when Google first appeared in like 1998 or something, you're like, oh, here's this thing called Google. It seems so much simpler to use than AltaVista. Let's try it. Hey, it has better search results. And Google actually started, like their first real office was like two blocks away, or actually one block away from where I sit in Palo Alto now, right, in a small office at 165 University Avenue. So there was a time when Google was a startup in approaching these problems and trying to figure out how to create value for, for people. Uh, the next is uh, a company you actually may not have heard of out of Boston called Insight Squared. And they're actually doing a little bit of the automated analytics and, and a little bit of the, the interface um, play. What they're doing is they've built a, a very user-friendly set of metrics that you can put on top of your Salesforce instance, right? So there's all these um, organizations in the world that use Salesforce to do their sort of traditional sort of customer relationship management and sales model, and they have all their people filling out all the forms that they need to do to track everything that's going on. What Salesforce lacks is actually a lot of good reporting and analysis tools. And so what Insight Squared is you basically, you sign up with them, uh, it's all sort of hosted on, on their website, you give them access to your, your Salesforce data, and suddenly you have an incredible set of, of dashboards and drill down tools to be able to see exactly how people are performing in your organization and what needs to change. Um, the third example is a company called Relate IQ. They actually just came out of stealth mode. They're located in Mountain View. Um, they were actually started by uh, a guy named uh, Adam Evans and Steve Laughlin, who used to work at Palantir, and they sort of looked at the way that we handle some of our internal data about how the company is running, and they decided to take it and go build a business around it. So what they've done is actually build a platform that integrates all of the data that you use to, to uh, to interact with the world. Everything from your emails, to phone call logs, to SMSs, to calendar items, into a single coherent interface. So you can have all of the context around any interaction that you have uh, with a customer or anyone else that you have to deal with in your business. And they, it's, it's really all about making that experience as frictionless as possible. If you check out their website, it's uh, really, really interesting what they're doing. And the last one, the one that I actually know the most about, uh, is Palantir, right? And so we are a software company. We build um, tools. To, for data analysis, platforms that can take many different data sets, put them together into a single coherent model, and then put a user interface on top of them uh, that allows analysts who know a lot about those real-world problems but not a lot about data, direct access to the data to do ad hoc analysis, right? And so the things that we build are actually, they're completely empty vessels. They're not, they're not for one purpose or another, just like a database is an empty vessel that is sort of useless when you first install it. Uh, you have to put in a schema, you have to put in data. Um, the Palantir platforms are the same way, they sit above traditional databases, uh, take all that data, integrate it together into a human conceptual model, uh, and, and give analysts access to it. So, um, so here is sort of a, a, a simple outline of the data model for Palantir Gotham, which is kind of our, our flagship platform. In Palantir Gotham, you have objects. Objects represent things in the real world. Objects have properties, which are the data that describe them, and they can have links to other objects, which map out the relationships between those objects in the world. You, when you build your data model, rather than sort of a traditional data model, which is all about data storage primitives, right? So if you think about like a, like a SQL schema, it's all about you have a table, you have some rows, you have some columns, they have data types like string and number and float. Um, instead, what's represented in a Palantir data model are the real world objects, right? So if we take the example of say foodborne illness, uh, you have people, people, the event of them getting sick, them checking into hospitals, them purchasing food from stores or restaurants, and food moving through the food distribution network to trace back to the original place uh, where, the, where the sort of the tainted food entered the system. You can even add in an added dimension of like uh, uh, DNA sequencing on the bacteria that's found in the people's guts so that you can actually get a match when you do samples uh, on the ground at the, at the original food sources. And those are sort of the real world objects that actually make up the way that you think about foodborne illness. Um, when the CDC, who uses, who uses our system to do this, they actually can go and get this data from the state health departments. They can go to the food distributors and say, give us your shipping manifest and all that stuff. We're trying to figure out where this food is coming from. So this data is coming from many different sources, but it all gets integrated into a single coherent system where the analyst can very quickly do traceback analysis. Um, under the covers, it's pretty technically complex. Uh, this is sort of... Um, 
this is a, like a network diagram of a fully provisioned Palantir cluster. We kind of ship a cloud in a box. Uh, the big yellow thing in, in the middle on the right side is actually what we call the dispatch server or the nexus. It's the thing that all the clients talk to. If you look at the little screens up at the top, those are the clients making access over the network to interact with the system. Uh, at the core of the system, there's a, there's a database and a search server. They work in tandem to, to provide all the access that you need to this data and integrate these data sets. Um, at the moment, it's Oracle, but we're in the process of replacing that with sort of a, a horizontally scalable, distributed, NoSQL key value store, just to see if I can get all the buzzwords into that sentence. Um, but it's true, we are, and we're even building a transactional layer to put on top of it so we can get the same properties out of the database that we can get out of the distributed key value store. Um, at, at the lower right, you can actually see this thing, maybe you can read it, it says Phoenix Cluster. That is um, our, our, we've actually taken Cassandra, um, added in some smarts about how we do indexing and compression, and we use that to join very large data sets. So when we're dealing with things like a 500 gigabyte a day log files, we bring them into the Phoenix cluster. Uh, there we can actually run MapReduce jobs to do some automated analysis and scoring of things that need to be queued up for human analysis. Um, so what we've done here this, uh, is actually take a lot of different pieces of open source software and tie them all together in a way that, that sort of makes sense and implements a reusable system, right? Uh, we've added in our own technology in different places uh, that sort of do things like real-time querying over billions of objects where you can get back an answer in under 10 seconds. But the idea is that the, the scarce resource, as I was talking about earlier, the scarce resource in this, in this system of data processing is actually talent. And so what we've tried to do is, is, is engineer talent out of the equation as much as possible and turn it into a product that you can take and buy and deploy. Um, so, in the, in the remaining time, I want to actually go through three different scenarios of, of real analysis. And um, in, in, the, in the interest of sort of time and simplicity, normally I would like maybe do a live demo or, uh, or show a video, but I'm just going to walk through some screenshots and talk about um, uh, the different scenarios. So the first one is actually looking at, at fraud in an online bank. Um, it, the, the way that these frauds get perpetrated is actually pretty, pretty simple. Someone gets access to someone's bank account. They, they, they get their password somehow for the online bank. They log into the bank. They figure out what accounts they have. Then they start moving money through a network of accounts and eventually wire it out of the bank, and now they have your money, right? Um, so here is, is a place where we actually use automation at scale to begin to figure out what's going on, and we use some simple rules uh, to decide what needs to be queued up for human analysis. So this is actually a graph of something that would be... Um, would be noticed by an automated recognizer uh, to, to be queued up for human analysis. At the top, you have two computer objects. They're connected to three different browser sessions, which is that middle layer. And those three different browser sessions have logged into 57 different accounts in the bank, right? Not necessarily indicative of fraud, right? You could have um, uh, a classroom simulation where they're sitting down at their two computers and running, you know, they've opened up some small accounts with small amounts of money and they're doing, they're practicing, you know, banking skills. It might look like this. But it also, fraud also kind of looks like this. So this is the kind of thing that now gets dumped into the system and an analyst starts picking through it. And um, they say, okay, well, let's ask the question where are all these accesses coming from? And so they can actually take and drag and drop these things onto the map. Um, and what'll happen is it'll show where the IP addresses are in the world, including a histogram along the bottom, uh, or a timeline, I guess is a good way to think about that. Uh, there's a timeline along the bottom of when the accesses are happening, and on the map is where it's happening. The things highlighted in yellow are coming from those two different IP addresses uh, in Nigeria. Uh, all the others are, are somewhere else in the States. But the fingerprinting system that the web logs use have determined that this is actually only two computers to begin with. So given how close in time the accesses are happening between Nigeria and the United States, one possible hypothesis is that you know, Starfleet has parked uh, a starship in orbit and they're using transporters to move computers to different points on the Earth. That would fit the data that we have. It's kind of unlikely since that technology, as far as we know, doesn't exist. Um, instead, what's much more likely is that you actually have a bunch of fraudsters who are in Nigeria and they're going to access these accounts through a network of proxy servers. And sometimes the proxy servers break or their tradecraft isn't so good and sometimes they forget to do it. So at this point, just looking at this, an analyst would say, okay, there's fraud going on here. Now we have to figure out exactly what the fraud is. And they can drill down through the accounts um, and, and look for um, you know, which accounts have the most activity. And um, the, the punchline here is actually a network that looks like this, right? So <clears throat> this is a, a network of actually a very sophisticated fraud. Um, the source for all of the money in this network is that account at the lower right, which is a home equity line of credit, right? And the way that banks like to push home equity lines of credit onto people as a way for them to open up a new credit line where banks make money on, and a lot of people say, I'll take the like $500 bonus you give me to open the home equity line of credit, but I'm not gonna do anything with it. I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm not even gonna check the balance because I know I'm not using it. 
then someone breaks into their account and says, hey, there's a $60,000 line of credit here. I should take this money. Um, and they start moving the money through a, a, a network of accounts. So they'll take some money, they'll move it into the checking account, from the checking account into a joint account, from the joint account into someone else's account entirely. Uh, in this case, uh, a guy named Bob, who's in, like this, uh, on the right is Elizabeth Larson. She lives in Maine. Uh, on, uh, up at the top, you can see uh, Bob. Bob actually owns a business in Beverly Hills, a surf shop. And they move the money through his accounts and eventually wire it out to, bank, to the Bank of China, and the money leaves the bank. And so it's, a, and if there's actually, if, if you see this live, there's an animation uh, of these dots actually flowing through the network, and you can see them all converge on the accounts in the Bank of China. Very clearly fraud and something that the fraud analyst at the bank would then freeze the accounts, figure out if they can claw back the money and that sort of thing. And so you can imagine teams of analysts, basically, this is a very difficult thing to data mine, a, a network this sophisticated, actually. But a team, an analyst, given access to this data, can actually suss this stuff out maybe 10, 15 minutes at a time for each one of these cases. And so you can very quickly move through a lot of it. Um, this was deployed, this is notional data, but it, a workflow very, very similar to this was, was deployed at a real bank. They saw their fraud rates drop about 75%. The system paid for itself ten, tenfold in about a year in terms of the amount of money they would be able to recover from fraud. The next example um, has to do with uh, something you might have heard about. We had a little problem south of the border that related to the housing market. It might have led to, I don't know, a global financial crisis that we're still feeling the bite from. Uh, and it related to mortgage portfolios. And so after the sort of housing prices started going down, um, banks started feeling a lot of pressure on their um, on their balance sheets, right? So normally when you make a loan for a house, it's completely secured by the house, uh, and the bank doesn't actually need to have capital to cover that loan. The, the house itself covers the loan. Um, but as soon as the price of the house dips below the value of the loan, now there's actually a discrepancy between what the, what the bank has on, the, on their balance sheets, and so they need to pull in a bunch of capital to cover the difference. And that this is money that they have to like borrow from the government or get from other sources that they can't actually lend out, which is the, the way in which banks are good for the economy and the way in which they make their money. So while it's difficult to sort of cry for the big bad bankers who made mistakes in the housing crisis, if this gets really bad, the bank actually fails. And a bank failure actually reverberates through the system and causes problems for everyone. And so as they're trying to figure out how to unload these things from their balance sheets, they need a way, uh, something that's better than foreclosure. Foreclosure is one thing they can do, but foreclosure tends to actually put a house on the market at 40% of the market value of the house. That's usually what the bank will recover. So they're losing uh, over 60%, like, and that's of the market price, not even forgetting about the loan value. So at least 60% of the value is just disappearing. And so a better remedy is something called a short sale. And a short sale is basically just selling the house for less than the mortgage is worth. Um, normally banks don't ever have to figure out what the right price for the house is. It, when the housing market is quote unquote working, prices go up, people sell their house, as long as the loan is covered, the bank doesn't care what, what price you got out of the market. But as soon as the bank is gonna actually lose some money on the sale, now they really care because there's a bunch of different frauds that you can perpetrate in doing a short sale. So what they need is a way to accurately price the value of a home. And this turns out to actually be incredibly difficult. The math behind it and the analysis behind it is actually very similar to doing things like pricing stocks and bonds, but getting all the data together in one place to be able to do it is actually very, very difficult. So uh, in the in, before uh, the system that we built, the banks that we talked to that were pricing short sales, it took them about four weeks to come up with a good price. Uh, four weeks, if you've ever been involved in the real estate market, is an eternity. Someone comes and says, I'd like to buy your home. What, is it, what does it cost? What, you know, what is the ask? And they say, uh, I don't know. Let me get back to you in a month. And they say, sorry, we'll go buy something else. Right? So short sale was not actually a, a reasonable remedy. Um, the system that we built actually reduced the time from four weeks to about 40 minutes, uh, which is like a big difference. You can sit and have a cup of coffee and then get the answer um, pretty quickly. And so. Um, what we ended up doing was, was actually taking and integrating sources of data coming out of the real estate markets, things from, from MLS, um, other things um, related to the loan portfolios in general. This, is a, this looks like a dashboard, but it's actually an interactive, it's an interactive dashboard that you can drill down, down to the individual loans. But this is a way that, that uh, banks can identify which portions of their portfolio are at risk and which ones they have to focus on, what remedies they can do. When they get down to the individual loan level, um, they're actually looking at the price curves as they change over time and what the value of the loan is and what the market value is to come up with a price that they're gonna be happy with. Um, this is actually in our platform called Palantir Metropolis, which is all about doing time series analysis and doing statistical and math related things to time series data. Um, so this worked really well. It actually let the, the, the banks really went for it once it became an existential issue for them. If you recall, <clears throat> there were a lot of irregularities in the paperwork that they were doing uh, with foreclosures. And at some point, the, the US government said, OK, no more foreclosures. You're going to have to figure out something else. And they said, 
hey, we should do short sales. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, and they were able to come up with a system that allowed them to, uh, very, uh, to, to give homeowners actually an inducement, say, look, you know, this loan has gone bad. You're going to take the credit hit no matter what. But how about we sell, we sell your house at slightly less than it was worth, and we're actually going to give you like $50,000 cash as well. And that's going to let you walk away somewhat whole, set your life up, find a new place to live, and, and no one's going to be sort of destitute and out on the street. Um, and this was a remedy that a lot of people went for. If in early 2012, there was like a $26 billion settlement between the government and the, and the banks related to foreclosures, and this was actually a part of that program, and our software made that possible. So before I get into the last example, um, I want to talk a little bit about being able to work on these kinds of problems. Um, one, of the, th one of the great things about working at a place like Palantir and being able to build these kind of things is solving real problems out in the world. Uh, and it's an amazing thing to be able to actually get up every day and have meaning in your work. And as people are building their companies and trying to attack attract talent, this is like a really important thing to remember. If you, can, if you can pick up a problem that actually gives people meaning in their work, they're going to be much more likely to work for you. They're going to be much more likely to give you their absolute best effort they can, and, and much more likely to not leave to go to do other things. So in order to build the technology that we've built, we've had, a, we've, we've had to have a very, very high hiring bar. We run around to like the 10 or 15 best CS schools and get people coming right out of school. And the thing that really differentiates us is they go, wow, I could go work for Zynga and work on games and try to trick people into you know, building virtual gardens or I could fix the economy, right? I can, I can, I can save people's money um, from being stolen by people overseas. I can work on any, any myriad number of problems that actually make a difference in the world. And it's, it's led us to have a very, very low turnover rate and be able to attract talent in the hottest labor market that we've seen in a long time. All the people that we're looking to hire have seven different awesome jobs follow, uh, chasing them and they choose us because they want to actually care about the things that they're working on. So it's a really important thing. If you can factor it into what you're doing, it's a, it's a real differentiator and a game changer. So the last use case is um, one that I'm particularly proud of, and it's sort of still an evolving story. Uh, Alistair alluded to it in, in, his, uh, in his introduction, and that is um, information management during disaster recovery. So there's an organization <clears throat> in, in the US called Team Rubicon. It's a veteran service organization, a volunteer organization, where, where veterans actually, uh, and non-veterans too, but they, they uh, will deploy into disaster zones after, the initial, after all the danger has passed and do the cleanup, right? Do the recovery phase. Um, and this is sort of the, the long, hard work of, of really putting communities back together after, after horrible things happen. And a lot of times there's even a race against time. So we saw this in Louisiana uh, after Hurricane Katrina, and we saw it after Hurricane Sandy as well. Especially when you have a water event, you have these homes that have filled up with water. If you can very quickly get all the water out of the home, take out the wet drywall, get all the muck out of it, the home will be okay. It's going to be you know, $15,000, $20,000 worth of repairs, but everything is fine. If you wait too long, mold takes over the entire structure, and the entire structure has to be destroyed. So it's a huge difference uh, in outcomes by just being able to very quickly react to these things. So our first engagement with Team Rubicon, this is through our flint, uh, philanthropic engineering team where we actually work with NGOs on um, really important problems out in the world that relate to data where we donate our software and our expertise to them to generate better outcomes was Hurricane Sandy. So they deployed into Rockaway Beach after Hurricane Sandy. Um, all these homes had been flooded. Uh, there was no power. Uh, we set up um, like uh, laptops running on generators, talking to an instance that was hosted in the cloud over like portable cell modems to be able to, to, to run the software. Um, here's uh, a view of Rockaway Beach. It's just south of JFK. You can see that the southern portion is the, the portion that sort of points at the ocean where the hurricane came in. You can actually see the sand that has, has washed up. Um, the reason there's a jagged edge on that imagery is that this is overflight imagery that was produced by uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, right after Hurricane Sandy to do damage assessment, and we were able to integrate that into the platform and lay it on. You can actually, if you're in the live system, you can switch imagery sources to like, like uh, Microsoft Virtual Earth or, or, um, and flip back and forth, and you can see like the nice pristine streets laid out in the homes, and you flip to this one, and you can just like see the devastation. It's kind of a before and after kind of thing. But what you're seeing here in all these yellow dots is all the work orders um, that, uh, that Team Rubicon uh, went out and surveyed. So they'd actually go to these structures, figure out what needs to happen to them. They could, we have a mobile client that they can actually uh, input that data directly. It goes back to base. Uh, and then people at base can actually figure out how to parcel out these work orders and know what the state of things are and very quickly uh, adapt to the conditions on the ground. If you contrast this with how things have, are done traditionally in, in disaster management, you have a bunch of people running around with paper and clipboards. Um, and usually they might know on a daily basis what's going on rather than like an hour to hour, minute to minute basis, and sometimes not even on a daily basis. And so what happened was um, <clears throat> Team Rubicon very quickly became the, the nexus 
for all the volunteer efforts in Rockaway Beach. You know, um, one day, the Clinton Global Initiative showed up with 1,000 volunteers and said, what can we work on? And it's like, uh, wow. And they were able, in a matter of like about an hour, to get everyone parceled out to actually go and work on different jobs and really make that volunteer effort stretch all the way. And it's really important, again, in this time reactive um, scenario where you, there's a huge outpouring of support and labor to clean this stuff up early on and it tapers off over time. So if you can't, if you can't use that really effectively, uh, it really hurts the recovery operations. So we, we went, um, after Hurricane Sandy, we went to a, a tornado site in Adairsville, Georgia. There we were dealing with a, a real a veteran uh, disaster recovery manager who worked for Team Rubicon. He, was, he had not worked with Palantir yet, and he was, a little bit, he was a little bit skeptical. He said, okay, we're gonna go out and survey damaged structures. If we can do 90 by the end of the day, we're gonna call this a really good day. By 10.30 a.m., they had 150 structures surveyed. Uh, by the end of the day, they had 467 structures, uh, surveys, st structures surveyed. Uh, and they share that data with the local authorities, with the county, with all the people doing recovery to sort of give the one coherent picture of the, the state of what's going on on the ground. Yes, sure. So why were you able to do it so fast? Yeah, I, I think the teams are actually to be able to move much, much quicker. Yeah, sorry, the question was why were we able to do it so fast? I think once they got in the flow of it, they could actually move from house to house very quickly and recording the inf information happened a lot, a, a lot quicker. Um, they, they also didn't have to, th like, when the, the mobile units out in the field actually report their location so that everyone knew where everyone was and they weren't crossing paths, they could, they could, they could break up sectors and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the most recent one that we've been to uh, was in, actually, this is just, it's a good French joke, right? Uh, the one after that we went to was in Illinois in a place called Marcel's. I know that here you would call it Marseille, but in Illinois they call it Marcel's. Uh, there was actually huge river flooding there, but after that we went to uh, more, more Oklahoma where the recent massive tornado ripped through there. This is actually a picture from uh, recovery operations there. Um, and you can sort of get a, get a feel of what it looks like to be on the ground. There's actually three of our folks uh, helping out. You can actually see a printed out screenshots of the maps from Palantir up on the wall. Um, they're doing, the, they're sort of sometimes engineering solutions a, as need be to, to add in things like uh, geo-clustering and targeting to break up large groups into work orders. Um, this is like, this is the outside of the recovery center. It's actually an inflatable tent. Um, and you can see they actually like take and project the, the real-time view of what's going on onto the ceiling to, so that everyone has good situational awareness of what's going on. Um, I think so the, the sort of the, the nice thing that came out of the story when the Clinton Global Initiative came to visit us at Sandy, President Clinton came along as well. He came to visit the operations center for a 10 minute visit. Uh, he stayed for an hour with his chief of staff being like, come on, we have to go. Come on, we have to go. He's like, no, 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 I'm staying. Um, and he was, he was very impressed with this. Uh, here you can see President Clinton in the middle is our CEO, Alex Karp. On the right is Jake Wood, who's the, the CEO of Team Rubicon. Together, we've, we've actually made a commitment through the Clinton Global Initiative uh, to build this disaster response system and make it available to like, all the cities in North America. So we're in the process of work, you know, prototyping and iterating with Team Rubicon exactly what that needs to be, and then we're looking to make it available for any kind of disaster recovery. Um, so it's really nice to be able to work on, on those kinds of projects. Uh, it's the kind of thing where you, know, you want to get up every day and go to work, You're like this is really important. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I have prepared. Hopefully that's interesting. I want to leave as much time as possible for questions. Um, you can ask me about the stuff that we worked on here, anything in general related to data, whatever you want to, whatever you think I might know about, I'm happy to talk about. So. No, I don't think we've done any crime mapping work in New York to date, yeah. Okay, so how, how would we compare to a company like Splunk? So Splunk is actually really about, um, uh, in some ways, data, there are, there are a lot of similarities. Splunk is actually focused re really specifically on network logs on computers and how you, how you bring that together into basically a search engine for that data. Um, we have functionality that's similar to that in some of our deployments where we're doing like cybersecurity work, we actually integrate with Splunk as a data source. Um, but there is a lot of overlap. We, what Splunk doesn't have is actually the really rich interactive user interface, and they're not, they're not actually a generalized tool. To, I mean, they, they're generalized for certain types of data, but we can bring in things like unstructured data, like, like documents and emails and things like that, and integrate them with more structured data as well. Yes?
Yeah, so the question is, you know, if what we're trying to do is, is build access to sort of non-technical users, um, how do we, or do we measure, like, who's using it? Yeah, I mean, we have direct access to these analysts. So, like, when we, like, you know, this is enterprise software. You buy it, you deploy it on your network. It's not, like, just hosted on a website. Uh, so all the users who, who use our system um, go through training. And we know who they are. We've, like, we, we have um, analysts. Like, we sell, we sell the software as software. Um, like, you, you buy it, you get a traditional license, but it actually comes with services included. And so the, that includes, actually, are people called embedded analysts who stay on site to train up the users and have direct access to them. Additionally, we've built in lots and lots of metrics inside the software so we can actually get reports out of the system about who's using what feature and what level they're using at uh, and that sort of thing. And we, we do that in a way that we can even get, we can even get the data outside, out, out from inside of classified environments because it, it has nothing about the data or the user information, just the aggregate statistics about who's using what. Uh, so the question was, how much of the work that Palantir does is related to the military? Um, the answer is some of it, um, and it's actually a decreasing proportion over time. Um, when the first sector that we that we targeted with our with our products was actually intelligence agencies, like civilian intelligence agencies, um, and that kind of naturally morphed in, into into the military realm. Uh, we do have military customers; they use it for a lot of intelligence analysis, putting together data. Um, but at this point in time, significantly less than half of our business is uh, in either the military or the intelligence sector. We're, we're sort of aggressively expanding um, in the commercial banking sector, you, everything from the, the mortgage stuff to various types of anti-fraud to different types of like, high-level analysis of what's going on in economic trends based on credit card data. Um, cybersecurity is a huge growing field for us as companies are trying to figure out what to do um, to protect themselves. We even, um, using one of our technologies called Nexus Peering, which lets two different, two different um, Palantir instances actually exchange data securely, uh, we had two banks who are basically competitors in the marketplace exchange data about a cybersecurity threat coming out of uh, what, what seemed to be Iran, trying to shut down those banks uh, using massive distributed denial of service attacks. And by sharing information, they were able to shut it down a lot more efficiently. Uh, uh, helping... Um, uh, Pharma companies actually leverage all of their research data, so they're not they're not so they can lower costs and and um, uh, figure out how to leverage the research that they've already done is something that we're actually seeing expanding very quickly. Uh, as is um, blinking um, insurance fraud. So in, in, the, in the health space, we see we see a lot of like the health health is like this huge space with tons and tons of data and tons and tons of problems, and there's not like a one size fits all solution. So that's that's uh, where we see a lot of the growth coming. Yes. We're happy to enable it where people want that. The question is, are, are we actively enabling sort of collaboration and use of open data? And that's kind of a two-part question, I guess. So open data is something that we're always happy to make recommendations about. I mean, we don't, as a company, we don't collect data. We generally don't provide data, but we do build connectors for existing data sources. Um, and, and usually integrating third-party data is a way to enhance analysis. Um, in terms of collaboration between people in the marketplace, that's something on a case-by-case -case basis. We've built technology to b let people do it. Um, and uh, we're happy to help them figure out how to, how to actually set up those connections between uh, potential partners. Uh, and in general, we think open data is a great thing. I mean, but that's, you know, it's in our self-interest, right? So, like, the more data that people have, the more the analysis they need, the more Palantir they need, right? We do actually do a lot. Uh, we're actually doing a lot in the, because we take our philanthropic work actually very seriously. There's a whole dedicated team to that. Um, and we, um, we are sort of... Um, big proponents of open data in that realm, like open government data, op NGOs actually creating data as value and sharing it. And we actually published on our blog um, sort of five rules for open data about how to get the most effective use out of your data. To, if, you're, if you're collecting data sets to be released, what's a, what are some good like, heuristics to follow to make sure that other people can get the, the most usefulness out of them? 
And that's, uh, that's about all the time I have. I, will, uh, I didn't get a chance to do it before the talk, but um, you can see my Twitter handle on there. If you check it out, I will put, um, I'll put links to certain things that I talked about in the talk on my Twitter feed with the hashtag to StartupFest uh, if you want to check them out directly. Thanks for listening. <laughs>